All right, hey everyone, welcome to our monthly office hours um, for the Visual Builder uh, service. My name is Shai Schmelzer, I'm part of the product management team. And today with me is also Brian Fry and Laura Eckel, who are monitoring the Q&A um, tab. So if you have questions about Visual Builder in general, or more specific about today's topic, uh, feel free throughout this session to post your questions in the Q&A and they'll be answering questions as we go along. I'll also have some time at the end for some Q&A. And to this um, seminar is about optimizing Oracle Visual Builder application performance, uh, how to do tuning, how to think about performance and some tips and tricks that might help you make sure that your Visual Builder applications run faster. Um, it's a topic that a lot of customers have been asking us about. Um, it's a topic that we help a lot of customers with through the years. And we wanted to share some tips uh, to help you make sure that your end users are happier with the application that you deliver to them. Okay. All right, so let's start by talking about um, what is performance tuning, okay? So performance tuning is basically a key aspect of your end user experience of your application. Uh, your application might be great in terms of overall, it's doing what it's supposed to do, but if the performance of the application is not good, it's gonna impact the perception of your customer of how they see your application. Um, so you should think about performance aspects of your application throughout your development cycle. Um, the minute that you start building a page, you should think about um, how it performs, you should evaluate it. And you should also probably think about performance even when you're designing your pages, thinking about how do I make sure that my pages are actually responsive and uh, come up in the browser quickly, okay? Um, there's also um, another thing to mention here that there's also the concept of real speed versus perceived speed, okay? Um, does the real speed of, for example, your page is loading, how many seconds does it take? There are all sorts of kind of psychological tricks that you can play on people to distract their mind while things are loading. For example, um, if your page has to do a bunch of data loading at the beginning before it shows any uh, UI, you might want to go into a situation where you start by showing something and only then load other stuff later on. So while people are looking at one point of thing and one point of data, uh, they might not notice that other things are still taking longer uh, to load. Um, there's also another thing to consider here, which is initial speed of rendering versus ongoing speed of working with the application. Okay. Um, and there are different views over here. Um, a lot of the, like let's say Chrome tools are very interested in how quickly your page starts up and someone can see something. But then in, and this is usually true for things like a public website, okay? You want the response for the end user to be out there immediately. But for people who are working, let's say, with applications that are back office applications, applications that are internal to the organization, you might want to, or you might be willing to sacrifice some of the performance of the initial rendering in order to give them better performance down the line. So when they are doing their work throughout the day, if the performance there is better and they pay a little bit for it at the beginning of the loading of the application, that might be acceptable. Okay. So again, there are different audiences and different aspects of how you would tune an application for them. Another thing to mention is that most of the load, uh, or most of the time that your application is going to spend is actually going to be spent in Visual Builder application and the architecture it's using. It's going to be spent on the backend, on the part that actually gets the data, that processes the data, on the layer that actually exposes all the rest services. Okay, um, and there are usually a lot of things that you can do to optimize that layer. We'll talk about it a little bit today. Most of our focus is actually going to be on the UI 
uh, layer that you developed with VB. A lot of the rest uh, sources of data that you're accessing are coming from other system and other products. And we're not going to deal too much with tuning those today, but it's definitely an important thing to consider when you're looking at the overall um, performance of your application. Okay. From the UI perspective, one of the key things we're going to focus on is the chatability of your application. How much talking is being done between your browser and your backend? How much network traffic you're doing? How much data is passing between your UI and your backend? This is a key area that you can tune and improve when working with Visual Builder. So the first thing you want to do is you'll want to focus your efforts. So usually an application uh, might consist of tens or even hundreds of pages that you've developed, okay? And not all of them are being used um, that frequently. Not all of them have a lot of customers using them. Um, so you would want to figure out which parts of your application are most commonly used and which areas or which pages are actually having performance issue. Maybe not all your pages have performance issue. Maybe there are some specific pages that are problematic. And there are various tools that you can use to look into the performance of your application. Um, the key thing that most of you are probably familiar with is the browser development tool console. And that's a place where you can get information about all your network uh, transactions, including timing of those network transactions. Okay, uh, you can also see there in the log in the console. You can see performance data about how long your page is taking to from, let's say, the start of an action until the end of an action, things like that. But there are other tools that are also more targeted at optimizing performance and giving you insight into what's going on. Um, if you're using the Chrome browser and you will open up the developer tools, you'll see on the right side something called the Lighthouse test. And the Lighthouse test is um, testing that Chrome does uh, on your application. It basically runs some tests and give you a report about a the overall performance. And you can see the type of report you're getting over here on the right side where you can see the results for the same app that I did before and after uh, tuning. So you can see that from a rating of 51, we got to 81 by changing some of the things that we'll talk about later on today. I also wanted to talk about a new tool and a new offering from Oracle called the Oracle Application Performance Management Tool, which is part of the tools that you can get in the Oracle Cloud. It's actually, um, they had a new release um, basically this weekend. Uh, it's now, it should appear in all your cloud accounts and you can spin up an instance of Oracle Application Performance Management and use it to track your Visual Builder application and not just Visual Builder, basically any web application and also a lot of your backends, okay? Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what it can do in terms of the performance tracking for Visual Builder or basically any web application. It gives you a very nice overview um, dashboard uh, of your applications. You can indicate to it which applications to track, and then you can get the type of report you're seeing right now. For example, a, you're all familiar with the Visual Builder Cookbook and um, the set of samples that we have out there hosted as an application. Over the last couple of days, we added to it the ability to track what people are doing. And you can see um, the type of dashboard that we can see over on this slide where you can see everything from the type of browsers that are accessing the application, the operating system and the devices, to also an indication of what is the overall experience uh, of the users when they're using it. Then you can see aspects like the time it takes for Ajax calls to operate, how many errors are people encountering and what's the overall response time of the page. Okay, so by looking at those type of things overall in your application, you can have a, a bigger view of how your application performs. But the Oracle Performance Monitor also has a much deeper insight that can show you the exact transactions that are being done by each page in your application. OK, 
Uh, it can show you the timing of each operation, it can group operations, and you can get a lot of reports out of it. I wanted to show you a little bit how it behaves. So to do that, I'm going to use one of the, uh, this is the page, by the way, this is the application performance monitoring. And I'm going to start by going over to one of our applications and uh, running it. So we have here what I call the slow application. And throughout today, I'm going to use the same application. I have three versions of it. I have the slow version, I have the fast version, and I have the even faster version. And um, so just so you'll see the overall, what the application does, we have a list of employees over here. We can click on an employee, uh, go and edit the data about this employee. Okay, we can then pick up a laptop for him. Okay, uh, assign him to a department, uh, select which country they are in, and also, for example, which city they are in, and then save the data. So, this is an example of what we do on this page. We also have other pages over here. We have a page that shows us a list of all the laptops that we have in our repository or also allows us to do searches on this page, on these laptops and get some data in a nice chart. And we have another page that shows us all the locations of our company with the ability to add a new location over here. Okay, so that's just a basic application. And what I did right now is I walk through this application, interacting with it like an end user would. Now, one of the things I did is I injected into this application a little bit of JavaScript into the top of our index page, which then communicates with our application performance monitoring. And I'm going to switch over here. Okay. And um, this is again, the dashboard that shows us all our web application. I can also go over and look at our um, employee web app over here. And I can ask to see the data for the last 15 minutes, for example. Okay. Um, actually, I might be looking at the wrong app. I need to look at the slow app. Yeah, because that's the application we just used. And we can see over the last 15 minutes, okay, we had one browser accessing it. It was a Chrome on a Mac uh, from a personal computer. And we can see over here the overall performance and response time. And we can see uh, it started very slow. It improved later on. We can also see the Ajax performance uh, uh, over here. And also if we had any errors, um, we can see it over here. The other thing that we can then switch to is a view of what we call the Trace Explorer. And the Trace Explorer for this application would give us the uh, complete set of actions that were done in our application, which we can see over here. Okay. And again, it can be seen in various ways. We also have something called spans of communication over here. Um, and you can see, for example, over here, we did a full update of one of our pages and you can then drill down into it. Okay. And it would show you the actual page that you accessed, okay, and parameters that were passed in and a lot of information about the response time over here. Okay, so you can get pretty detailed information about what people are doing. Um, the, the section up here at the top actually allows you to do queries and searches and grouping and get uh, all sorts of statistics about averages and maximum time and things like that. Um, and it's very useful for you to go in and look at your application and the interactions that it's doing and get information about the performance. Um, a lot of people, have been asking us over the past um, several months, how do I monitor the performance of an application uh, while my user are using it? And this is an example, okay? So again, you have here a page, for example, that you're uploading, and then you can see actions that are being taken. For example, over here, we can see we went over and we called our laptops um, fetch of data, okay? We got information about our laptop. So that was this operation. After we did this operation, we did another 
operation. Okay. And you can see that this one also fetched information about laptops. So you can see we actually went and fetched information about laptops twice, took us quite a long time, almost a second over here. And the overall timing here is over a second and a half, which is very slow for a page to load. Okay, so this might be the place where you would want to go over and see what's going on. Okay, why am I accessing laptops too many times? And this is the type of things that we're going to tune in our application and we'll talk about today. Right, so this is again Oracle APM, a tool that you can get from today over inside your Oracle Cloud. So now let's go over to the crux of our um, seminar. Let's talk about some tips about performance tuning. So one of the things that a lot of people do automatically in Visual Builder is they use the quick starts to bind tables, lists, charts to data coming from a REST service. And it's always important to understand what is actually happening behind the scene. What are we actually doing there? And there are two types of variables that um, you're going to very frequently use inside Oracle Visual Builder application. One of them is SDP, the service data provider. The other one is ADP, the array data provider. Now, when you're using the quick starts for binding data to lists, we automatically bind things to service data provider because service data provider gives a lot of functionality out of the box for you without you needing to do any coding or any configuration, okay? But it's important to understand when is SDP the right choice and when you might want to consider using ADP, okay? The key difference between the two, by the way, is that an SDP doesn't store the data on the client in a way that is accessible for you later on. An ADP, an array data provider, actually fetches the data, store it in an array variable on the client that you can access later on. This is the reason, for example, that editable table are always using ADP because you need to edit the data after you fetched it and modified. The other difference is that SDP does a lot of things for you, including, for example, executing the REST calls automatically for you. You don't actually go over and say, now go over and fetch the data into the table. The minute that the table is shown, the SDP is executing a REST call to get the data into the table. In an ADP, you as a developer have much more control over what is going on and when to execute the query. Um, the other aspect here is the out-of-the-box functionality. SDPs by default are doing things like pagination, okay, or bringing in just the needed fields from a, a table for you, okay? So if you look up a table that you bound to an SDP, um, when you fetch the data, you would see that it's fetching it in batches, what we call pagination. And you would also see that it passes in information about which fields from a table in the backend we want to fetch, okay? If you're doing things in an ADP, you need to specify those things. Uh, it's also true for things like queries. So if you're doing search on a list of value, SDP knows how to send the search information automatically. If you're using ADP, you might need to do those type of things, okay? At the end of the day, you might want to look at SDP versus ADP on where they are appropriate. SDPs are functioning in a way where we believe there's a lot of data in the backend. It's a large data set and that this data is always changing, okay? So we rely on the backend, okay? On the source of the REST service to do things like sorting or querying, okay? Um, and to return just the amount of data that we need. ADP is more appropriate in situation where you don't have thousands of records, rather we're talking about tens or maybe some hundreds of rows that you want to fetch, okay? And uh, it's also uh, very useful for situations where you have data that is a little bit more static. For example, if you're fetching a list of, of countries, okay? Assuming that not every day a new country is being created in the world, this list can actually stay uh, in your client once you fetched it for all the pages that are going to meet this list, okay? Um, so using it in an ADP rather than an SDP might be faster. Also, um, 
if we're talking about query aspects, okay, if we get a list of employees and we want to search the list of employees, if my organization has 100,000 employees, getting all of those to the client and doing a search on the client is not going to be efficient. Doing the search in the database on the backend using what SDP does by default would be much more um, proper to do in this case. It would result in faster performance. But if we have, for example, a list again of countries with like 200 countries, we can get it to the client and do the search on the client without doing any network traffic to the backend, without doing another query to the database that would actually be faster on the client. So again, um, those type of considerations of when to fetch the data from the server or when to handle the data directly on the client are things you might want to look into. And based on that, know if you want to bind your UI components to a service data provider or an array data provider. In a lot of cases, the end uh, point to think about here is this balance between the number of queries that you're going to execute from your client to your server versus the size of data that you're returning from the server to the client. Uh, it's a fine balance. Uh, we don't have an exact rule of thumb that says this is the number of rows uh, where you should switch over to SDP or you should use ADP. But it's a lot of it is going to be like uh, experimenting on your side and it's going to depend on the source of data that you have, how fast it reacts to queries, for example, and um, how good are the search capabilities on it and things like that. But that's one thing to consider when you're looking at your application. As I mentioned, pagination is a key thing also to look into. Um, usually we're talking, when we're talking about Oracle backends, we're talking about thousands of rows in a database. You don't want to create a situation where you're fetching thousands or even a lot of hundreds of rows over to the client every time. Uh, this is going to overload the client memory. It's going to be slow in terms of the network traffic. It's gonna take time. So most of the modern REST services offer uh, pagination capabilities, and that's the ability to send to the client sets of data. Okay, so instead of sending all the 1K employees, we're going to send 10 employees at a time, or maybe not 10, maybe 20, maybe 50. Those are things that you can actually control. So uh, it's important to mention here that if you're working with a business object in Visual Builder, or if you're working with the uh, REST APIs that are exposed by Oracle Cloud applications, those have those sorts of paginations built into it, and Visual Builder automatically knows how to use those. Okay, so it automatically sends over pagination information when it does a query to indicate how many records to return. Okay, and then when you scroll down, it would fetch the next set automatically for you. If you're on the other hand using REST services from other uh, sources, maybe you're using ORDS, maybe you're using some REST APIs that you expose to Oracle Integration Cloud, or maybe some third party REST services. The first thing you need to verify is that those services support pagination, that they have this option. Okay, for example, ORDS does have this option. But the way that you specify the syntax of pagination for ORDS is different from how you do it for business object. So when you're talking to other REST services, you need to tell Visual Builder how to pass over the information to do pagination. And you do this by specifying the transform option uh, for your REST service. We have it covered in, uh, in our documentation, also a bunch of blogs. So make sure that when you're working with a REST service, with a REST endpoint, you are leveraging pagination uh, options and that you're also using the right settings on the UI component to fetch data as needed and to pass in information about how many records to get. Okay, and last point I make I would make here is that in a lot of cases, you actually want to first filter what you're going to show and only then show it. So instead of just fetching everything and showing it, first let people put in their query conditions and only then fetch the data. So I wanted to show you something that um, is happening in our slow application. Um, so when I I accessed our application, sorry, over here. 
I'll go back to the employees page for a second. I'm gonna open the inspect over here and I'm gonna show you the network tab right here. And um, you can actually see this constant fetching of information happening here for the laptops. Okay, we're constantly going over and fetching information. It's the same thing, by the way, if I go to the employees page and um, you would see over here, we're doing a lot of fetches to employees. And every time, if you look at those fetches, I'll pick up one of those um, and just open it here. You would see that we are passing pagination information. We're fetching 25 records at a time, okay? And, and this is very inefficient what is happening right here. In fact, you can actually see the screen refresh. So you might want to, you might wonder how did we get to this situation? So I wanted to show you how this page was actually built initially. Okay, so I actually have here the empty page. Okay, and I'll show you how I initially built this page. Um, I had the employee business object at the backend. I had my empty page over here. And I did what most of you would probably do when you just start developing. You would take a table, drop it on a page. So drop it here on the page. And then I bounded it to data coming from employees. Okay. Um, and then you just pick up the fields that you want to show. So let's say name, salary, um, which department we're in and which country. Okay, or maybe which laptop we want to fetch. Okay, I'll just keep those for this case. And then we click finish. And then we get the data to show up here. And you can see that in design time, we don't actually have any performance issue. We got the results and um, there's no extra fetching, things like that. But if we would actually take this page and run it right now, okay, and open the inspect on this page, okay, now that we're running it, you would see here are all the fetches happening. So what's the difference? So by default, when you bind a table to a set of data, we're binding it to an SDP and the setting for the SDP by default is to fetch 25 records at a time. When we're in design time, because we don't want your design time to lag, we're actually limiting the number of records that are being fetched to 50 records. Okay, this is actually what you can see here in the little warning. Okay. And we expect you to actually set limits on the table about how many records to fetch. Okay, so in my case, in the backend in the database, I have about 400 records. So you can see those fetches happening in bunches of 25, okay, uh, which is not efficient. So the first thing that you usually want to do for a table is actually set the height for the table. Okay, so if you go over, um, and look up the property for style. And let's set a height for the table of uh, 500 pixels, okay, like that, okay? And let's run the same page now and look at the network traffic now, okay? So we'll clear the network traffic. We're running the page now. And what you will see now is that we are only going to do a single fetch of 25 records, okay? Which is what you're seeing over here. Now, as I scroll down, you can see another fetch happening. This one fetches the next 25 records. So starting from 25 and fetches the next 25. I scroll more down, you're going to see more and more fetches as I scroll down. But instead of having this huge operation of fetching all the records at the beginning, I'm now in full control of uh, uh, doing pagination. So for a table, it's very important to set the height and then this controls the aspect of not fetching everything. Because if there's no height, we just try and fetch everything over. The other thing that you would want to look in terms of properties for a table, same thing, by the way, for a list, is uh, the scroll uh, policy. You want it to use the load more on scroll. This does the pagination for you. And then there's the load, the, the scroll policy options, where you can actually specify the fetch size. So for example, if you know that in your initial page, in the height, you can fit 50 records, okay? Maybe that's what you want to set. So instead of uh, basically fetching two fetches of 25, you can fetch 50 records initially in one go, okay? 
You can also set a max a number over here. And again, we have it by default set to 500. The reason is because a UI that requires users to scroll through hundreds of records is not efficient. This is not a good UI experience, okay? So those two things control your pagination options and you can set them up for a table. Uh, it's quite important to do that if you want good performance from your application. Another thing that you uh, actually seen in my demo when I showed you the breakdown of the laptop page in the application performance monitoring was that I was doing two fetches from the laptop table. And this is again, something that might happen in your application if you don't pay attention. In a lot of cases, you're showing on the page the same information in two ways, okay? If we look, for example, again, I'll switch over, um, I'll switch back to our application to show you the laptops page, okay? And we'll again, clear everything here. Um, so our laptop, again, has this issue with fetching information about, oh, this is actually the fast application. So um, we need to show you the slow one. I think, um, yeah, I need it over here. All right, um, I'll open this in a new tab over here. We'll do the inspect and we'll switch over to the laptops. Um, and what you can see here again, we have this uh, constant fetching, but I'm gonna show you one fetch here, this one which actually passes in information saying fetch a thousand records, okay? And that is because we are showing the same information here about laptops, one time in a chart and one time in a table, okay? So again, if we go back to the way that we built this application, okay? And we look at the laptops page, what we did here is we basically dropped the laptop on the page twice, once, with um, a list and once with a child. Okay, so we basically did something like that. We looked up list, dragged the list, dropped it here. Okay, bound it to data from laptops. Okay, picked up some fields that we want to show, uh, like um, let's say the uh, model name, okay, and the manufacturer, for example, and the CPU and maybe the price. Okay, over here, this was the list. And then we did something similar over for a chart. So we picked up a bar chart, drop it over on the right side and bound it to data from the same location, laptops. Okay, and again, we showed here, for example, the price for each uh, model name. Okay, so if you look at, like the data is correct. We're showing here exactly what we wanted to show. But if you look at what happened at the backend, you actually created two variables. Okay, because I did it multiple times now, there's multiple variables, but you created two SDPs, one for the table and one for the chart. Although both of them are fetching the same information. Both of them are fetching it from the same source of data. So if we go back to our slides, the point that we want to raise here is that you can combine those fetches and make it in one go, especially if you're showing the same set of data. Okay, so in our fast application, okay, um, if we would look again um, over here in our fast application, this one, okay. We actually combined the two fetches into one. Okay. We only have one SDP in the back, laptop list SDP, and then we just switched it so the uh, list and the uh, chart are both based on the same thing. So if I look up L here and I have my list of L computers and the chart of them, they are both coming from the same SDP, okay? You can look at the data source. This is the same SDP as this one, okay? Therefore, I cut in half my number of queries that I'm doing. 
I'll also mention one more thing, even if it's not the exact same data that you're showing here, because over here I'm showing the price over here, and over here maybe I'm not showing the price, but I'm showing the same set of data, I can actually have uh, configured the same query. I'm just adding more fields to the initial query, to the SDP, and then I'm splitting the fields to show some of them in the chart, some of them in the list. Okay, so that's another important thing. You can actually control which fields are being fetched. You can fetch fields that are not being shown in the list and then assign them to another place on your page. So when you're doing the initial query, you're getting data. You might as well get some data that you might need later on, even if you're not showing it initially. The next thing is storing data in higher scope. This is especially true for lists of values, okay? By default, when you drag over and do a single select component or a select one component on a page, we're creating an SDP and we're fetching the data into this SDP every time that you open the list, okay? So again, if we switch back to our slow application, which I think is over here, and we'll go over to the employees and we'll go over and pick up an employee uh, and go and edit that employee. Actually, that's not the instance, that's the instance I wanted. Okay, this one. We'll go over, pick up an employee and go and edit this employee. Okay, because of the multiple fetches here, you can see it's hard to actually click on an employee and go edit. Okay. Uh, I wanted you to look at the network tab and see what happens every time that I pop up the laptop list. Okay, I did the fetch here to fetch laptops. Okay, now if I close this list and I click it again, there's another fetch to bring in the laptops. So every time that you pop up this list of laptops, you're going to do a fetch similarly in the department. If I click over here, you can see I'm fetching departments. Okay. Um, and I can choose a department. And then if I go back and I open it again, there's another call for the department. Now, this might be the way that you want it to behave. If your data is constantly changing on the backend, okay, you want this ability to fetch the current list of values every time. But in cases like the list of laptops that we offer, the list of department that we offer, this data doesn't change so frequently. Also, um, the list of countries, for example, that we have over here, we use it both in this page and we also use it in another page in our application. When we create a location, we have a list of countries over here. Okay, It's the same list. So instead of fetching it for each location multiple times, what we can do to accelerate our application is move it to be fetched once per the application. And we did this again in our faster application. If we go over here to our faster application, you would see that at the application level, okay, we have variables uh, that are of type ADP. We have array data providers for countries, department, and locations. And when we load our application, the first time that we load our application in the VB enter, we go over and we do an action chain to fetch those lists of values into our array data providers. And then those array data providers are used as the backend for the lists in each one of our pages later on. Okay, if we go back to the slide, the point here is that for lists that are used in multiple pages, you might want to raise the scope of the application from being in a page level to being at the flow level or maybe the application level. And you might want to consider storing the data in an ADP and also fetching all the data one time. Okay, So instead of each time going and doing a search, getting all the data onto the client. Okay. By the way, then when you're doing a search on um, this data, the search can be done directly on the client without additional queries to the backend. The other thing that you just saw is that in our load event, we ran things in parallel. So one thing to know about browser is that they allow you to 
execute REST calls in parallel, okay? And in fact, when you are using a service data provider, it automatically parallels calls from the same page. So if you bring up, for example, the page that has um, multiple lists on it, okay, uh, you'll see in the network traffic that those lists are being populated in parallel with parallel calls. But when you're working with your own REST fetches, it's up to you to manage those and do it in parallel. So in our application, when I load those lists of values for countries, departments, and laptops, I do this in parallel at the beginning of our application load. So in our actions, there is this run in parallel option that you can drag and drop into a page, place it over there, and then start to do REST calls in parallel. Okay, so execute one REST call here, and in parallel do another REST call, okay? Um, and this is basically what I did just up here, um, running those REST calls in parallel um, when I'm loading the page. All right. Um, just do a little cleanup here, like that. Um, so think about it. Just remember that in your browser, there is a built-in limitation depending on your browser on how many of those REST calls can be executed in parallel. Um, I think today in Chrome, it's about 10 REST calls uh, at one go, okay? Uh, but take advantage of it. It basically cuts your execution uh, time for REST calls uh, quite drastically um, when you uh, do those in parallel, okay? The other thing to do is a pattern that we call fetch when ready. Okay, in a lot of cases, um, we have a tendency to show a table on the page with data when people get into the application, okay? But in most use cases, what people are actually going to do with this table is then scroll to find a specific record in this table and do an operation on that record. So in those cases, it would actually be better for you to start by not showing anything and just having the application um, show an empty screen, basically, with a search button. So again, if we look at this um, application over here, uh, our fast application, what you would see in the laptops page is that we're not actually fetching the data um, and showing you a list of laptops and a huge graph with a thousand bars in it. Okay, like we saw in the slow one, but other when you go to the laptop page, we start with a search bar, okay? And then we're asking you, okay, which laptops are you looking for? And if you're looking for a Mac, I don't know if there's Mac, if you're looking for something that has air in the name, it's uppercase, um, we'll fetch those initially. Oh, sorry, I, I'm running on an instance that doesn't have the data in here. Um, this is slow, slow. Slow, okay, we'll go back to the first application. Okay, um, open it here and go to laptops. So again, we're starting with a search. You're putting in your search criteria and only then we're fetching the data, okay? Um, so this allows us to be more focused and it reduces the amount of data that we're fetching and it also reduces the initial load time of the page. Because we're starting with a page that doesn't require any fetches initially, the page loads much quicker. And then once the user actually knows what they want, they put it into the search page and then we get the data. This approach of having the search at the top, okay? Uh, this is how Google works, right? You go into Google, the site is very simple. There's one text field. And only after you fill it out, they go over and they invoke logic on their backend, fetch data and show it to you, okay? So this is another uh, cool approach uh, to UI design that impacts your performance. Uh, this is something, by the way, that we are heavily using inside our Oracle SaaS, Oracle Cloud application now. The new Redwood model is all about this search bar at the top, starting from there and only then getting you data. Another thing to consider is storing data on the client, okay? Again, if your data is not changing that frequently, it's, if it's relatively static data, you can actually store it on the client 
and reduce the calls to the backend for even longer than just a single page. Okay, you can store it on the client for um, minutes, hours, or even days. And it's all controlled by a header that you're setting uh, in your REST calls. Okay, and the nice thing is if you are using business object in Visual Builder, we now made it so you can control this aspect in a declarative way as part of the definition of your business object. There is this area over here called resource cache control, and you can indicate how long to store the data on the client. Once it's stored on the client, next time that you're going to fetch it, we're not actually going to go to the server and get it. We're going to leverage the data that is on the client. So again, if I switch back to my fast application over here, okay, and I'll go over to the location table. I'm going to open the inspect because what I want to show you is actually in the network tab when I go and create a location, okay, and I pop up the list of uh, countries. Okay, so let's clear the network and I do the list of countries. You can see that um, initially this is going to fetch, oh, actually, no, it's not fetching anything from the server. The call over here is actually the call to the performance monitor that I'm doing right now. It's not for the countries. And that's because the list of countries is already stored on the client. Similarly, if I go to the, um, um, the employee page, and I click on an employee and go and edit the employee data over here. And again, I'll clear the list here and I'll fetch um, the laptops. You're going to see a fetch happening because we have a lot of laptops, okay? But if I go to the departments, okay, you can see I'm not doing a fetch because the data is already here on the client and I'm using it from here. Okay, so in your application, you have a place for business object to specify it. If you're getting data from a REST in the backend, a lot of cases you can add this header about client caching to indicate that this data doesn't need to be fetched every time. Uh, so take advantage of it and reduce the number of network traffic that way. And then the um, last point I'm going, or last two points that I'm going to talk about today is actually reducing file sizes, okay? There are two files that are being downloaded when you're running the application, um, a Visual Builder application uh, that you have control over their size. One of them is the file that describes the REST services, okay? So if you run a VB application, you'll see uh, um, open API service files being fetched. Um, and those can become very big because those files have the description of what the REST service results look like. And if you remember, when you're adding a REST service to your application, there's a place there where you put in a sample of the results. So Visual Builder would know what the structure is. And what a lot of people do is they test the REST endpoint and then just copy the results over, okay? But in a lot of cases, this test returns hundreds of rows, okay? And then the sample that we're using is of hundreds of rows where all we need is the data about a single row uh, and the structure of that single row. So what you can do is you can easily um, set this to be a more accurate. So again, if I'll go over, I'll pick up, um, a REST endpoint, we'll pick up the REST endpoint for countries, this one, for example. Okay. When you're in a, an application and you're developing access to a REST, point, REST endpoint, you're adding the REST endpoint. Okay. You define by endpoint, you put the sample here, you go next, you go test, send request, and then what you are automatically going to do in a lot of cases is just click here, save as example response. But what you just did is you created the file with the data about 240 countries. So this is a pretty big file. All that VB needs is just the, 
basic structure. So what are the names of the variables? And we can get this from the first record that we have here. So the first record here is Afghanistan. We can actually go over and after Afghanistan, we can mark this whole section up to the end, okay? Remove all the countries, the rest of the countries and just keep it this way, okay? And save the response. Now, instead of 240 uh, countries, I only have one country. The file is much smaller and this file gets downloaded to the client. So this is your way to control the size of the file. And um, we highly recommend that you look at your existing REST endpoints that you defined and figure out if your sample, okay, of the response has a lot of data or just the needed data. And this is a nice way to improve the performance of your initial page creation, okay? And um, there's another place where this is impacting and this is in business objects that have relationships between them, okay? And um, you can see over here, because employees has relationship to city and to department and to laptops, there's a lot of endpoints that we can execute. But in some cases, you don't need all of those endpoints. You don't use them, okay? So you can click over here to edit the endpoint and uncheck relationships that you don't need to fetch, okay? And this again will control the size of the description of the REST endpoint that is being downloaded to the server. And you can use the, again, the network monitor to monitor that file size. An even bigger impact on the size of the download that is created for your application can be achieved by doing the optimize step for your application before you deploy it, okay? So if you're using Visual Builder Studio, uh, there's a step called package and app, and there's a checkbox called optimize for it. Uh, if you're not using Visual Builder Studio, you can use a grant task that we have that is called VB optimized. And what it does is it takes your application and optimize it for production deployment. And it reduces the number of files that are being passed. It compresses files, um, again, reducing blank spaces, things like that, and creates a much slimmer footprint for your application. You can actually see this if you have a good eyesight over here on the right side. Uh, where you can see on the left side uh, an optimized application and on the right side a non-optimized application. In a non-optimized application, you would see things like for each page, like the employee flow, we're going to see a JSON file, a JS file, and an HTML file being passed, okay? So again, HTML file, JavaScript file for a page, okay? For a flow, again, multiple files over here. If you compare this to your optimized application, all of those are being packed into one file that is being transferred, much slimmer, much faster, okay? And it's basically, it's free for you. You don't need to do anything beyond just check this checkbox for optimize the application when you're doing a deployment. So again, if we would go back into um, our Visual Builder Studio, Okay, and um, when you're working on your project, there's the deployment chain over there and the deployment chain, the build step that is called package has this option. And right? so if we look at our, um, let's say a TV show package over here and the configure, there's this little checkbox that called optimize application. You always want it to be checked when you're doing your production deployment, okay? Um, again, if you're not using Visual Builder Studio, you can achieve it using our grant task for build automation, but we hope that you're using Visual Builder Studio. And if you're not using it because you're not familiar with that, that's the topic for our next month meeting. All right, a few other tips about performance testing. Okay, the first thing is that when you're testing the performance of your application and you're tuning it, make sure that you're doing it on some sort of real data set, okay? Um, if in your development, you're using a list of employees that has 10 employees, but in your production, you have 100,000 employees, you might not notice some of the performance aspect 
during development or testing. So maybe not in development, but in your QA type, make sure that the size of data that you're using is somewhat realistic, okay? Um, again, focus your um, performance tuning on the things that would make that would make a big change. Okay, if there's a fetch in your application that you can reduce in half a second in terms of performance, but this page, okay, if you improve it in half a second, is used by a thousand employees twenty times a day you're actually creating a big impact compared to reducing a second from a page that is never used that of that frequently, okay? Another thing to think about is to consider uh, your database design when you're designing your application and optimizing it for performance. When you're working with business object, you're actually creating a database behind the scene. So things like, do I use code tables or do I just keep the actual value without needing to translate it to another table might be something that impacts your application. Okay, so the number of reference fields that you're using uh, and whether you need them or not is something that can uh, impact performance, for example. Um, one more tip, if you are testing performance of your application, make sure that you're testing not the preview of your application, but rather either the stage or even better, the publish with an optimized version of your application. Um, even in terms of JDBC connection that we're doing in the backend to business object, there's a difference between the preview stage and the stage stage. Uh, part of your application, the stage part of your life cycle. So either stage or publish your application when you're doing performance testing to get a more realistic view, okay? And one more thing to mention, if possible, we highly recommend that you load test your application before you go production. I know a lot of people don't have time to it, then they go production and only then they realize, oh, we have a slow application. We have a lot of calls going over to the backend. Uh, we should have thought about performance tuning and scalability before that. Um, if you incorporate those techniques of thinking about performance tuning as part of your developers, uh, implementing some of the tips that we cover today from the get-go, it would create a much better application. And when you go production, it wouldn't be a production today, but then wait, we have two more weeks of tuning. It would be, we go production and everything is ready for our customers on the first day. So hopefully those have been some useful tips for you um, about how to perform men's tune your applications, what to look for, how to do some tuning and how to optimize your application. Um, watch the network monitor, incorporate it into your daily development cycle. Look at what your page is doing behind the scene and make sure to implement some of the best practices. And if you have any other tips and tricks, uh, feel free to share it with us on our community page. Maybe write a blog, maybe write a LinkedIn post and share it with the rest of the community. And we have a um, LinkedIn group for visual builder developers. We hope that you're part of this LinkedIn group. If not, just go into LinkedIn and uh, search visual builder. And uh, let us know over there what you think about the product, any other tips, share information between people. And if you have any further question, again, our Cloud Customer Connect Forum is very active. Uh, we would love to hear your questions over there. Um, this is it for today. Next week, we are going to talk about team development and lifecycle management of Visual Builder application using Visual Builder Studio. This is going to be next month's meeting on April 19. We're changing the time slot a little bit uh, because of the move to daylight uh, saving time. Uh, it might not work great for all the locations, but as always, we would have a recording of this session so people can watch it later on. Um, that's it for today. Um, by the way, if you uh, signed up for this seminar, you're whitelisted for our Oracle Cloud free trial. Uh, you can actually start a free trial of Oracle Cloud today, get even more uh, points or more uh, dollars to spend on this free trial. And one thing that you can do with this free trial is spin up an instance of the Oracle uh, performance monitoring, the application performance monitoring, and hook it up to your Visual Builder application. Uh, we would have a blog published about how to do it um, 
probably in the next couple of weeks, showing you step-by-step -step how to hook up your Visual Builder application into the Oracle application performance monitoring. All right, that's it for today. Let's see if we have anything still open on the Q&A side. I know that uh, Brian and Laura have been pretty busy answering questions over there. Um, Brian has. All right. There was one question that I couldn't answer that I said I would get, uh, raise it for you, which is uh, there was a question about whether you could use ADP with uh, load more on scroll policy. I wasn't um, sure. Yes, uh, sort of, but it's going to be quite complex because um, you control the fetches into the ADP and you can pass in the calls, you can pass pagination information to your REST backend. So you can set up those things. And as you scroll down, you can execute it more. But the reality is that it's much easier in those cases, if you're going to do a scroll more or load more on scroll to actually use an SDP, which gives you this functionality out of the box. Uh, and then you don't actually need to catch the event in the table of scrolling and then execute the rest call with the right parameters. This is all done automatically for you by using an SDP. And um, so that would probably be our recommendation. Um, right, I see that we're at the top of the hour. So thanks everyone for joining us today. Hope to see you next month in our upcoming seminar and keep in touch. Have a great day.